Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about hemodynamics. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand, and uh, your instructor's done a super fantastic job uh, making sure you understand this, but when you're dealing with hemodynamics in the body, we're talking about blood flow. What affects blood flow through the body, right? Are the vessels too tight? Are they too wide? How much blood do we have? Do we have enough fluid flowing through this system, right? Is it meeting resistance? Of course, if your vessels are too tight, your blood is going to meet resistance when it comes out of the body. And so we're going to look, when we're talking hemodynamics, we're going to look at these things right here, pressure, flow, and resistance, okay? So what kind of pressure um, is exerted on the blood? How good does the blood flow? And it says also known as the amount of blood or volume of the blood. Um, and we got to look at like that, that is moved during a specific unit of time. Now we're going to try to make this as simple as possible. Okay. And does it meet any resistance when the blood comes out of the heart or maybe down in the legs or wherever, right? All three of these together involve hemodynamics. So let's read this. The inner relationship for the forces, pressure, flow, and resistance that affect the, the blood's circulation through the body, okay? So when we go down here, I want us to just to kind of get a little overview. That's all we're doing is how does the body regulate blood flow, okay? Now, this is kind of interesting because your body is really fantastic. On a normal basis, our body is constantly adjusting things, and we don't even realize that that's happening in us. Our blood vessels, especially the veins in our body, have the ability to expand and contract. That's kind of fantastic, right? Uh, the arteries are a little bit harder. They're a little bit tighter, but they also have the same ability, just not as good as, as the veins. Um, so if our blood meets resistance, it could be within the veins, it could be within the arteries. The vessel walls constrict and dilate in response to the need of the tissues. So you think of your think of your vessel as a muscle that is able to tighten or able to expand. And this is going to be kind of important because as the body gets older, as people get older, they lose that nice ability for the muscle to tighten and expand. OK, so that could cause a problem with blood flow. All right. Um, blood flow is also controlled by the heart rate. Uh, when, when we don't have enough blood, like, you know, guys, when, when you're dehydrated and you don't have enough blood flow, um, the heart's going, Hey, give me more blood, give me more blood. And so the heart will speed up when the, when there's not a very good blood flow and it, cause it needs more oxygen to get to the tissues. That's why the heart speeds up. Blood flow is also regulated by the strength of the heart contraction. Okay. So. The heart is a pump. That's its job. It's its only job is to be a pump. So if the muscle of the heart has changed shape in any way, and I can show you here in a little bit, then uh, it's not going to be a good pump. And we're not going to get that left ventricle pushing blood out to the body and causing um, this nice amount of blood to be delivered to the organs. Okay. So just be aware of that. Uh, we're going to look at, when we look at these things, we're going to look at how much cardiac output the patient is having. So we're going to pretend like we're working for a heart doctor now, okay? We're going to, and I'm going to educate you. You're going to, uh, we're going to team up our doctor issue. And we're going to say, okay, cardiac output is the volume of blood ejected from the heart per minute. Usually it's about four to eight liters. If you're a very tiny person, you're probably going to only have four four liters. Um, and if you're a very big, large, tall person, you might have eight liters, right? But if we are working in a heart office, we're going to get very specific, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the stroke volume, and that is the amount that is ejected with each ventricle contraction. So the ventricles fill, and then they, then they slam shut. Right? That's for stroke. Think about it like, like stroking when you're on a, a boat. Each time you paddle, that's a stroke. Each time the heart, the ventricle closes, that's a stroke. Okay, so we're going to look at the volume that's ejected per stroke. And then we got to also look at the heart rate. 
How many times does the heart beat? And both of those numbers together equal our cardiac output. I do think she's going to ask you about stroke volume and heart rate and that it equals cardiac output. Now, this may seem like I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but as we go through this, we're going to start simple and then we're going to get more complex, okay? When you see these words, preload and afterload, and I would, and if I wasn't recording, I would ask you, but I want you to think about preloading and I'm going to draw a picture for you, okay? Let me make sure my thing is on here. If I was to, let's draw a heart down here, if y'all can see that. And I'm going to draw two atria and I'm going to draw two ventricles down here. I know it's beautiful in that. When we preload the heart, what we're doing is we're filling the heart at the right ventricle. I know it's the left on this page, but if you look at the patient or if it's the patient, it's the right. So it says, I think it says, think of the volume and the amount of blood that is in the heart at the end of diastole. So preload is preloading the heart with blood, okay? Like you're preloading a gun. We don't want to do that, but we're preloading the heart and it happens at the end of diastole. I do think you need to know that, which means when you have, let's just say we have a blood pressure of 120 over 80, at the end of this 80 is when preload happens, okay? At the end of diastole, just before the ventricles are ready to contract again, we're gonna get preload in the heart, okay? It happens really quick, so, but it says this volume stretches the heart muscles for contraction, all right. So preload is the right atrium of the heart, right? That's the measurement we're getting, and it happens at the end of diastole, all right. So let's look at afterload. Oop, sorry, I don't know what's happening to my pen. Give me a second here. I don't want to scribble all over my page, but I'm going to have to get my little eraser here. Let me get my eraser and I'm going to erase all this scribbling that I just did. All right. Let's um, let's draw here. Um, I think it helps to have uh, pictures. OK, so that's why I'm drawing it for you. So if we're going to do the afterload, we're going to look at some different type of measurement. OK, we're going to look at this area right here and the amount of blood that is pushed out to the body. This is your after load. So you just think, hey, after the blood's pumped out, that's my after load, right? But when we're looking at after load, we're gonna look at resistance here. This is what we're gonna look at is, is the blood meeting any resistance as it's coming out of the left ventricle? Okay, so blood flow during ventricular ejection, the resistance in the pulmonary and systemic systems is what we're looking at. Then we're gonna look at another measurement and it's called contractility, okay? The ability of the pump, can it pump? Does it have a good muscle? I'm gonna show you something here. I'm gonna kind of draw my atrium, my ventricle. Normally there's a, a thinner muscle around the right ventricle and then there's a really thick muscle around the left ventricle. Normally in the heart, that's what it looks like. Uh, we can go down to this picture. This will be super helpful because you can see that the uh, muscle around the right side is a little thinner. The right ventricle is a little wider. And then you've got the left ventricle that has a really thick muscle. Now think in your mind, I'm going to ask this question to you. Why do you think that the left ventricle has such a thick muscle? Just think about that for a second. It's because that muscle on that left side has to be able to slam shut hard enough to get the blood to go all the way out and around the body, okay? So we've got to, we've got to have a nice, thick muscle. Now we're looking at this from a normal standpoint, but you're going to work in the ICU and you got to know that these people's hearts aren't going to be normal right? They're going to have problems with some of these things. Make sure, and on my notes here, I say, this is how the blood flows through the heart, okay? You want to make sure you know how your blood flow through the, through, uh, through the heart, right? So if we look, um, these are in blue because these are the deoxygenated uh, um, areas in the heart. So let's look. I'm going to try to draw, and I hope you can follow my pen, but I'm gonna go in from the superior, here's the, here's the superior vena cava right up here. Here's the inferior vena cava, and it's gonna take blood and put it, drop it right into this right atrium. 
Okay, so you can see here, there's the right atrium. Then it's got to go through this tricuspid valve right here, and then it goes into these right ventricle. But one of the things I want to point out is it goes into, and I don't know if you can see me drawing right here, into this pulmonary artery. Now, this is an interesting fact because the pulmonary artery, I don't know if you notice it says artery here, carries deoxygenated blood. There's no oxygen in this artery, all right? Usually in every artery in our body, there's oxygen, but in the heart, there is no oxygen in the artery here, okay? What will happen is then the blood will go to the lungs somewhere out there. It's gonna come back into the heart through the pulmonary veins. And in the pulmonary veins here, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna draw a little line. The pulmonary veins, are oxygenated, okay? Yay, so the veins in the heart, or the pulmonary veins have oxygen. So you can see pulmonary veins. So then it comes into the left atrium here. Then it goes through the mitral valve or whatever is called the bicuspid valve. And if you notice, the reason why it's called bicuspid valve is it has two little coordinate tendinase. I don't know if you can see them here. The reason why this one over on this side is called tricuspid valve is because it has three coordinate tendinase that open the valve. Okay, that's why. And then we have, then we're going, we are in the left ventricle. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, the left ventricle is probably one of the most important parts of the heart because if the left ventricle isn't working, you're not gonna get blood flow out to the body. Okay, so we're going to the left ventricle and then we go out through the aorta. Woo, you look at this, aorta is taking it out to the body. All right, so you, you've got to make sure you know that. But when we get, you know, pulmonary veins and everything, these are all oxygenated. So when we're looking and I may, uh, let me take and erase what I just did. Um, and you're going to have this recording so that you can... Uh, you can actually go through, I'm going to try to erase this because I'm going to use it for a second. Um, you're going to have to look at how to measure preload because remember, we're going to look at, we're going to be working in a heart doctor's office together, okay? And so when we're looking at this heart, the reason why I erased everything is we're going to preload the volume. So what that means is we're going, our body is going to dump blood right here in this right atrium, okay? Remember, we measure it at the end of diastole. So your readings will correlate with your patient's volume status like your CVP. Now, when you, and this is where it gets just a little bit confusing and you may already know this and if you do, I'm so proud of you, okay? But there is some measurements we can take inside the heart when we're working at a heart doctor's office. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the right atrium. We're going to measure CVP right here. And then there's another measurement we can do is called SVR. Now, in the real world, you can measure the right ventricle and you can measure the, the left atrium. But for you, thank goodness, you don't have to do that. OK, so a CVP, if we get that measurement, that tells us what the preload is. OK. If we get an SVR, that tells us what the afterload is, okay? So we are going to see a measurement here. And so then we also have to be aware of how does the heart pump. So let's go down here to this. And if she gives you a little bit different measurements, which I think mine are correct, uh, make sure you know. So I'm going to draw again. I'm going to draw these measurements here. And I'm gonna say, oh, my preload should be between two and six. This is my CVP or my preload measurement, okay? When I'm looking at my left ventricle, I'm also gonna get a measurement and it should be between 770 and 1500 dynes um, per second. That's the measurement, okay? And this is your SVR. You're gonna to need to know this for your test. This is why I really wanna show you. Now, Contractility means the muscle part of the heart should push out our cardiac output. This is our cardiac output coming out to our body between four and eight liters. Um, so 
by working in a heart doctor's office, let's get patient specific. Okay. Let's say for this patient, because not all patients are alike, everybody's different. So we're going to look at a cardiac index, which should measure 2.5 to 4.2 liters per minute. So when you work at a heart doctor's office, you can get really specific and say, this patient puts out six point something liters, right? You can get really specific on that. That's called your cardiac index. Look, it says hint, you do need to memorize these values. She's going to ask you, what are your values? So what I would encourage you to do is draw it out for yourself. The more you play with this information, the better you're going to remember it, okay? So now we know normal values. Let's go down, and I'm going to lower my preload down just a little bit here because you're the nurse, right? Okay, we're gonna. I'm going to draw these atria really big, and I'm going to draw my ventricles really big, all right, just so that we can add some things in here. We are measuring CVP or preload, and it should be two to six here. Over on this left ventricle, we're measuring SVR, and that should be 770 to 1500 dynes. Okay, these are the pressures we need to know. So here's the pro, here's what you're gonna have to be able to do. Okay, so we're gonna start out simple. If the CVP is high, let's so let's just say our CVP is up. Let's say it's above six. I will just say greater than six, okay? Then the pressure going in here is going to be up, right? This We're talking pressure. So what do we do to get rid of the pressure when the CVP is up? We have to pull some fluid off. We have to give diuretics to pull some fluid off, or we either we have to open the vessel. So we either vasodilate, all right? So these are some ways we can decrease the pressure going into the heart. This is where it gets a little confusing, okay? So if your pressure is low, let's say, remember, we have to have pressure. We're a pressure system. If we don't have the proper pressure, our blood is not gonna pump around the body very good. Whether it's too much pressure or too little pressure, we're, we're going to have problems. If our pressure is, um, oops, I put, let's see, decrease CVP here. If it's less than two, let's do that. I actually saw a UWorld question the other day and it said their CVP was one. Okay. They don't have very much pressure going into the heart. So we got to bring it up. So what would we do? We got to fill the vessel. Um, I actually sat in a class, her class the other day when I was in Parrington. And I heard her say, what would you fill the vessel with? Now, you can fill it with 0.9% normal saline, or you can fill it with lactate ringers, or you can actually fill it with blood, depending on what the problem is. So we're going to fill the vessel, okay? We're gonna fill it up, we're gonna replace volume. Um, now, let's look down here at our left ventricle. If our SVR is up, Okay, if it's a like, I actually saw this the other day. Let's just say it equals 1800 dynes. Ooh, that means we have too much pressure coming up. This would be increased SVR. Then we got to do what? How are we going to, what are we going to do with the pressure that's too much out of this ventricle? We're going to vasodilate. We got to open those vessels up. Okay. If our pressure is low coming out of the heart, we are going to press the vessel. We're going to give vasopressors and we're going to tighten it so that it has some ability to move the blood. This is all about moving the blood here, these SVR. If it's pressure's too tight coming out, we got to open it up. If it's too not enough pressure, we got to tighten it up, okay? So we're going to look at these pressures and we're going to figure out what to do. Now, uh, I'm sure if you have questions, uh, I'll let you ask them here in a minute. So write down your questions. When you're looking at contractility, remember the heart muscle. Okay, we're going to draw this. Remember how we showed the right ventricle has a little thinner one, and then the left ventricle has a really thick one. Uh, what happens over time sometimes 
is maybe one of our valves doesn't close quite right. You guys, I don't know what your ages are on here, but let's just say if you're in, if you're, uh, when you're 30 years old, your valves just don't shut quite right, maybe, okay? We may not notice it, may not cause any problem for us right now, but what will happen is it will cause one side of the heart to work a little harder and it will actually cause the heart to change shape a little bit, okay? And so you may get a very wide ventricle with a very thin muscle around both areas. And when you have that very thin muscle, um, you're not going to have a good pump. You're just not. So somebody invented, I love this, they, they deserve their money if they invent these drugs, a, an ability for a medication to get into the heart muscle and give it off, to give it contraction, okay? These are called inotropic drugs. And I know that you guys have had digoxin in your farm class at some point, way long time ago, maybe. But we also need to know that dobutamine, milarone, and dopamine have the same ability. And they get into the heart muscle and they give it off. This is a this is a game changer for heart failure patients because if they don't have a good pump, we can cause the heart to work better just by these medications. Remember your digoxin, and we'll go over that this in a minute. But your digoxin has a range. Remember, it's zero point eight to two or zero point five. I, I don't know which one she said. So it it has a therapeutic range that it has to be in the blood. Remember also the digoxin causes the heart to work. Harder, stronger, slower. So what it does is it gives the muscle umph, like a, you know, pressure or able to push. And it also causes it to work a little slower to allow the time for it to feel better and everything. So these, these drugs are fantastic and you're going to need to know them. Okay. So when we look at hemodynamics, okay, let's take a breath here and let's really look. Why do we need hemodynamic monitoring? Well, you don't if you're healthy, but if your heart is not functioning correctly, we want to be able to assess and trend how much perfusion is going to the tissues. Because guess what? 20% uh, of your cardiac output immediately goes to the brain and 25% of your other cardiac output goes to the kidneys. So... The first organs to suffer if we don't get good perfusion is the brain and the kidneys, okay? And this will be important to you uh, in the future because if the heart isn't working, if there's heart failure, I'm gonna ask this question, do you think your patient will pee? No, probably not. You're gonna see it in the urine output, okay? They're, because the blood isn't making it to the kidneys to filter out. And so, we're going to look, so this uh, hemodynamic monitoring is going to help us detect an impending cardiovascular crisis before our organs get damaged. That's why we're doing this, okay? Accomplished by measuring the physiologic relationship between, we've got to look at our heart rate, we've got to look at our blood flow, and we've got to look, can we deliver oxygen? Those are important things. So let's go down here, give us a little AMP of the heart real quick. We're going to look at our arteries. We're going to look at our veins. We're going to look at our capillaries, and we're going to look at the amount of blood. Okay. Now, remember, arteries under high pressure, right? You guys already know that. Uh, there's not a lot of volume. There's probably about 30% of your blood volume is in your arteries, but they're under high resistance. So if you cut an artery, you can bleed to death really, really quick. They can dilate and they can constrict according to the demands that are placed on it. So these have that ability. And then we're going to try to get the blood all the way down to the little bitty capillaries, right? This is where oxygen exchange occurs and carbon jumps off the blood and oxygen jumps on into the blood. And then our veins are going to take that deoxygenated blood, which are under high capacity, which they contain 70% of our blood volume, and they have very low resistance. So they, you know, it's not a lot of pressure going back around the body. So they either vasodilate or they vasoconstrict um, to help the blood. 
make it around the body back into the heart. All right. So our blood, typically a normal person has about five liters of blood, typically five liters of blood. Uh, it includes 60% plasma. You guys are going to get into these uh, in another chapter. And 40% of cellular components, which is our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and our platelets, okay? Now, I want to stop right here because I want to say something to you. If your patient's not drinking very much fluid, do you think that their blood might be thick? Okay, I want you to think about this. Uh, I'm going to give you an example, and my husband's going to really appreciate this on a video. Uh, very good. Thank you all for commenting on my little chat there. Um, he used to drink, all he used to drink was Coke. All he used to drink was Coke. And I said, you need to drink water or, you know, that's not healthy for you. And of course you can't tell somebody something that they don't want to do. Right. So he has type O negative blood, which is really popular. And they always call him to, to get, you know, give blood. He donates. And I remember one time he went to give blood and they put the needle in and it was really thick and it wasn't coming out. It was very viscous. Okay. Viscous. I know I, I don't want y'all to throw up, but it was very thick. And the nurse who was doing it said, do you drink any water? And he's like, well, I drink very little water. And she says, you need to drink more water because the more viscous or thick the blood, the more turbulent the blood flow which then decreases the flow down to the microcirculation. So we have to look, is the blood thick? Is it thin? Um, how much blood is there, right? And so be aware, these are all factors that'll play uh, a part in a uh, patient's blood flow around the body. Now let's look at the physics of it. I'm gonna move this down so we can see this all on one page here is, we have to know that, <laughs> I know we don't often think, we never think about this really, but our body is a pressure system, right? It's like if you took a hose and you turned on the water and a certain amount of pressure has to come out in order for you to squirt water very far, right? Pressure in a liquid system is the force exerted on the liquid to move it from a high pressure to low pressure. That's exactly what's happening in the heart. The heart is trying to put pressure on the blood to push it around from a high pressure to a low pressure and then back around to the heart, okay? Blood flow is the amount of blood we're moving over a certain time. And then we got to look at driving pressure. The driver is the heart. The, the muscle of the heart is the driver of that pressure, okay? Specifically the left ventricle. So. If it meets resistance uh, as it's coming out of the heart, whether it's uh, too tight or the blood's too thick or whatever the case may be, uh, we look at the ease to which the fluid flows through the heart or the vessel and we measure friction. And it says it all depends on the viscosity of the fluid and the size of the blood vessel. Does that make sense? I hope. I hope that makes sense. And I'm trying to say it's simple because it gets a little bit harder. Okay. So now when we get into hemodynamics, we're gonna pay attention to some of this vocabulary here because hemodynamics is what? Flow, pressure, uh, volume, all these things. And so when you work with me at a heart doctor, let's pretend like we're going together, we're gonna to look at the patient's cardiac output, which should be between four and eight liters per minute. We're also gonna specifically figure out what their cardiac index is uh, because we're trying to get accurate here in the ICU. And so we're going to find out what their BMI is. And uh, based on that, the computer will usually calculate it. We live in that day. Uh, they should have about 2.5 to 4.2 liters per minute. Okay, so based on their weight and everything and normal is, is about that. We look at the stroke volume. How good does that left ventricle push the blood out per stroke? That's important. And if you see here, it says about 60 to 130 mils per beat is a normal stroke, a stroke volume. 
We also look at the preload volume. And remember I said that is at the end of diastole, right? So if you have the 120 over 80, we measure it at the end of that 80. Okay, that's that diastole. And then we look at the afterload. So remember preload is the measurement is CVP and that should be two to six. And then we have the afterload here, which is SVR. And that should be 770 to 1500 dimes, right? Those are the measurements. So if you get these measurements in your mind and you understand what you're looking at, when you're looking at measurements, you're going to do really well on this test, okay? Remember, we talked about this, and I know, like I said, that a lot of this is repeating itself. So we've got our heart rate times our stroke volume, which should be between 60 and 130, right? Uh, and then we figure out how much cardiac output the patient should have. Um, so it says stroke volume is also affected by preload and afterload and contractility. So the, the stroke as however much blood is in the left ventricle and how much it pushes out is affected by all the other measurements. That's what it's saying. Okay. I know I'm twisting your brains around, so hang with me here, okay? So now we have a good understanding of what preload is, I hope, right? So I'm gonna draw it out to the side again. We're gonna draw it again, and we're gonna get a little more in depth here. I'm gonna draw our atria and our ventricles. I'm gonna draw it big, because I'm gonna draw some stuff around it. Preload is the volume at the end of diastole, when the ventricles are at their fullest. So when we get this number, 120 over 80, that's the end of diastole, but this is when the ventricles are the fullest in the heart, okay? The ventricles are ready to fire uh, and they're, they're full. So here's the thing, okay? We can't measure this measurement unless we have uh, some type of a catheter, okay? So this is where your central line and your pulmonary arterial line are going to come into play. If you want to measure your CVP, you just need a central line because a central line sits at the top of the right atrium. Okay, that's where your central line sits. We're going to put a central line. And a central line can only measure the measurement inside the right atrium. It can't give you any other measurements, right? But I'm going to get a little further, and I know I don't have the pulmonary artery on here. Maybe we can draw like the little, little valve here. When we do a pulmonary arterial catheter, this catheter goes into the right atrium, down to the right ventricle, and sits up into the pulmonary artery. That's why they call it a pulmonary artery catheter, right? Another name of it is called a swan gantz. So uh, when we have this pulmonary arterial catheter, we can measure SVP, we can measure SVR, and of course, we can measure these other two measurements that you don't have to know. So a pulmonary arterial catheter can measure the whole, all the pressures within the heart. Um, and remember, our central venous pressure, our SVP, can only be measured by a central line. Right. It has to be a line in there somewhere to measure it. When you have a pulmonary arterial catheter, it can measure all the pressures in the heart, including the SVR. All right. Uh, we have to know what they are. Right. And we have to know how to treat it. We have to know if SVP is high. We're going to remove volume. If it's low, we're going to replace volume. That's what we're going to do. What are we going to do? It says for decreased preload. And what I would suggest you do is I would say this. I would write S. Um, I'm going to give you all a sample of how to measure it for yourself. Um, when you have this, I would just put decreased CVP and then I would put increased CVP and I would put what are you going to do for it out to the side? I mean, I only have a small space. Make it pretty. Make it pretty for yourself. What you're going to do is you're going to create a memory. Because if you don't create a memory for this, you're going to get really confused on, on the test. So if your CVP is down, what are you going to do, right? You're going to replace volume. Well, what things can you replace volume with? Look, 
IV fluids. Remember, I think she talked about 0.9 normal saline and she talked about lactate ringers. We can also replace volume with blood products. We can do packed red blood cells. We can do fresh frozen plasma. We can do platelets and albumin. Uh, the other day I asked somebody, I said, what does albumin do for uh, as a blood product, right? And people are like, I, I really don't know. Well, blood, like let's just draw a blood vessel here. You put blood in this vessel, it stays in the vessel, hopefully, unless the blood gets too thin. Um, if you put these other components in, it stays in the vessel. Now, albumin has no oxygen carrying capacity, which is, you know, some people don't want blood, so we might give albumin and it doesn't carry oxygen, but what it does is it, it expands, a, albumin is a volume expander that expands volume so that we're able to bring pressure back up. And so until our body can catch up making the red blood cells, albumin is a very good uh, tool or so, uh, fluid to um, bring pressure up because it has uh, big proteins in it and it can't leave the vessel. Some, some fluids can switch and leave vessels, but albumin stays right where you put it. So it's gonna bring up volume. All right, I know I've said a lot, right? So if we have increased preload, which it would be increased SVR, we're going to get rid of some of the circulating volume, maybe a diuretic, right? Here's, here's the diuretics. And what I would do is I would create myself a nice chart because you're gonna need it for a visual. Uh, Lasix or furosemide, Bumex is one that she likes to use and people be like, what is Bumex? I've never heard of that. If we have to in the ICU, we could give them mannitol, which is the big mama of uh, diuretics, right? This one is more found with ICP. This one is, is more like when you have intracranial pressure, but they can use it for that. Uh, we would also, if we have increased preload, open the vessel. We could use nitroglycerin or nitroprusside. Those are the vasodilators. They pop open vessels to allow more space. Uh, remember, our vessels can normally constrict and dilate, and we can cause them to constrict, and we can cause them to dilate. Okay, so make yourself a really nice uh, note here, uh, a design it to where we had one whole page. Like I created one whole page and I drew the atria, I drew the ventricles, I drew my SVR out to the side of this, my CVP out to the side of this, I put my number. And then I said, well, if it's high, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I can use to do. It. And if it's low, this is what I'm going to do. And this is the medicine I can use. And then I do the same thing for afterload. Okay. So when we're talking about afterload, um, we're talking about blood coming out of the heart, or we're talking about stroke volume right? I mean, not stroke volume, but SVR. That's our measurement. Um, resistance to blood flow during ventricular ejection or the force that opposes the blood flow. It could be a vessel that's too tight or a, a hardened uh, aortic artery. Uh, we don't know. But uh, SVR is your left ventricular afterload. And you've got your number. Now, this is what you're going to put on your little chart. If it's decreased, if it's down, that means the tube is too wide open. We don't have enough pressure to grab hold of it. We're going to have to, and guess what? You haven't got there yet, but in shock and sepsis, your uh, vessels are too vasodilated. That's the problem. Um, I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to say something. When you get to shock and sepsis, uh, a lot of people think you die because your chest closes off in uh, septic shock, right? Or anaphylactic shock. But what happens is your chest does close, but your rest of the vessels in your art, in your body completely massively vasodilate. Yikes. So uh, when you're dealing with that kind of a, a deal, you're not going to get blood flow around the body, which would cause low blood pressure hypotension, you're not going to get a good urine output because blood is not making it to the kidney and your SVR is down because it's not pushing out the blood, right? So we're going to have to press the vessel. And how do we do that? Well, think about it. If you're in anaphylactic shock, 
and you have an, an allergy and all of a sudden your chest is tight and your vasodilated, you're going to, you're going to reverse that in the body. There's a very good reversal. It's called an EpiPen or an epinephrine. So if you give epinephrine to the patient, let's say you give it in the thigh, immediately it's going to send the patient to the sympathetic nervous system. It's going to open the lungs, but it's going to constrict the vessels in the extremities to bring up the pressure. That's how you're going to save somebody's life. Uh, a patient can die from too low pressure. And that's what kills them really in anaphylactic shock when you have an allergy or allergic reaction is you start to vasodilate way too much. And your kidneys and your brain aren't going to get the blood they need, plus your chest is closing. So think about it. How do we how do we tighten that vessel, right? Phenylephrine, uh, I can't say that. I want to say afrin, but that's kind of like a, an afrin drug, but it's not no spray. Uh, norepinephrine epinephrine, and then there's something called protrescin, okay? Uh, if she gave you another drug in class that I didn't hear, then make sure you add what your vasopressors are because I don't want you to miss any anything. Um, if you do give epinephrine, and she did tell you, because these are older notes, she used to ask more, more questions, but you would give epinephrine, if you give it IV, two to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, for boards, remember epinephrine is very uh, toxic to the tissue. And so if you're going to give it into a vessel, it becomes a vesicant and it becomes dangerous. It can cause necrosis of the tissue. But these drugs are going to press the vessel to bring pressure back up. Okay. So if we have too much pressure, we're too tight. All right. We got too much pressure coming out of the heart. Our SVR is high. Then we are going to do something else. We're going to open the vessel right? Look at your drugs, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, those are vessel dilators, right? And then we've got calcium channel blockers. Now, a lot of you may go, I don't understand, or maybe you do understand how a calcium channel blocker works. I'm going to show you why a calcium channel blocker is not just for blood pressure, okay? If you have an EKG, and I'm sorry, I'm not a very good drawer, okay? Um, what happens is you exchange sodium, potassium, and calcium here. When the ventricle slams shut, it slams shut because of these electrolytes, sodium, potassium, and calcium, cause that reaction to cause that ventricle to shut. Now, what happens is this is the reset. This is the T wave, right? And so um, if you see here, if we block calcium, if we give a calcium channel blocker, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to lengthen out this QT interval. So what it's going to do is it's going to slow the heart down. Now, if you give a calcium channel blocker, do you think you could slow the heart down too much that the heart could stop? Mm-hmm. Yes, you could. So be aware that if a patient is taking a calcium channel blocker for blood pressure, we could slow the heart down too much. We've got to be careful, right? Uh, but it's given for other reasons because it works inside the heart and it can reduce the um, reset of the heart, which will allow time. It gives you a little more time for blood uh, to move around the body. OK, if you get on a test, if you get on your boards or you get on a test because you guys are halfway to your boards. Right. Uh, calcium channel blockers end in pine, zim and meal. So you've got to make sure you look at the ending. If you say, I don't even know what this drug is, then look if it ends in pine, zim and meal. If it does, it's a calcium channel blocker. All right. Uh, nitroprusside uh, is IV nitroglycerin, I believe. And it's 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Now, whether she wants you to memorize that, I don't know. But you need to know what can vasodilate uh, if you have increased SVR. So this would be increased SVR. See how I put it out there? So take my notes and map it for yourself. I think that's going to be really helpful. Let's finish. We're going to look a little bit further because it gets it kind of repeats but it's going to get a little more in depth. Okay. So I'm going to 
make sure you understand here. I know I'm drawing these atrium ventricles like crazy, but we have, you guys know, you have an SA node and you have an AV node, and then you have the bundle of his, and then you get the right and left bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers. You know the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart, right? It sets the rhythm for the heart and it happens right here. And that beat should be 60 to 100. We have in our body, we have what's called, and you guys learned this in, in uh, sorry, I have a crick in my neck. Um, you guys learned this in AMP. We have an autonomic nervous system that constantly is sending us from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic and adjusting our vessel size, adjusting our heart rate. Um, it's That's what the autonomic nomic nervous system does we also and some of you guys wonder why what else affects the heart rate well guess what ph ph will affect the heart rate right and so this is why we get abgs our body temperature can affect our heart rate hmm. okay uh look what else what kind of drugs can alter heart rate so if you look, I want you to see there's there's a couple drugs and you probably already had experience with some of these. This one, and if y'all were talking to me, if you want to put it in the chat box, uh, what is a beta blocker do for the heart? Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, what does a beta blocker do for our heart? How does it work? I know I've said it before on a video, but you've got to understand it's normally a blood pressure med. That's what you normally think of it is. But a beta blocker takes the patient out of the sympathetic nervous system. That's how it works. And so by taking someone out of the sympathetic nervous system, it relaxes the vessels. All right. Just make sure that's what's happening. So when you see your heart patient, on a beta blocker, which normally propanolol is one of the best ones for this. Um, it's taking the patient out of the sympathetic nervous system and relaxing the whole system to slow down, to open up vessels, those kind of things. So when you're taking it for blood pressure, it also does the same thing. A person who has a lot of anxiety and goes to the doctor and says, you know, I got this anxiety, my blood pressure's high. Um, and the doctor will say, well, let's, you're probably stuck in the sympathetic nervous system. Let's slow it down. Let's give you a beta blocker. Okay. That will help you when you get to, um, that's going to help you when you get to your uh, uh, boards, because you got to understand how it works. Now, atropine is going to do what? You know what? You guys are used to, it's a anticholinergic and you know, it drives you up but it's going to speed up the heart. Remember you give this to somebody who has bradycardia, right? So we can either decrease the system with a beta blocker, or we can increase the system with atropine. Thank goodness. Um, so, and guess what? It's also gonna improve our blood pressure. Hmm, double whammy right there. Um, you guys gotta understand the medications that you're looking at when you're on this exam. So we have uh, the heart is a con it's a pump. You know, I have to tell you something when one time my washing machine went out, my son, he fixes everything. And so I called him over and I said, can you kind of look at the washing machine? And he pulled out some of the stuff and, and the pump of the washing machine looked like a heart. I said, Oh my goodness. That looks just like it would be a heart. It had little valves that open. And as the water pumped out, it was just kind of crazy. Um, so the same kind of pump that pumps the water out of your wash machine, um, that kind of pump, that's the same similar kind of pump that pumps blood uh, through your heart and to your body. So the force at which the heart propels the stroke volume forward into the vasculature, right? There's a, something called Stirling's Law. I don't know if she mentioned you to you Stirling's Law, but it just is really what that I just said, it's just the force that pumps the stroke volume forward into the vasculature. Now we already talked about cardiac output. I hope you know that we already talked about cardiac index. That's patient specific. It says, how do we get all of our heart measurements? 
we either have to have a, a, a what is it, a cardiac catheter, or we have to have some type of pulmonary arterial catheter, right? Remember, we talked about how we get the measurements, and there has to be some type of catheter. Uh, but we could have a continuous monitoring device called a flow track. And um, I'm going to show you a picture of a flow track. I think it's down here. Hold on just a minute. Let's see what it looks like. I'm going to scroll down, and we aren't going to be able to cover all this in one day. But here it is right here. I believe this is called a flow track. And so if you're looking at this and you're going to look at this computer screen, it's going to make more sense to you because if over here, look at this, we got, and I don't know if you can see this, we got stroke volume 70. Normal stroke volume should be 60 to 130, right? Cardiac output. We are going to see the patient's cardiac output. I don't know if you can see that. And that should be four to eight. We're going to look at SVR. Oh, look, it's high. 1911 it should the highest it should be is 1500 dines and then we've got um stroke volume which is 31 mils per minute here and it should be way more than that so what we're looking at is we've got stroke volume coming out of the heart and i know you can't see my black marker going around the body and then coming back up to the right side and when we get over to the right side, we're going to measure CVP. And over on this side, this is that left ventricle, we're going to measure SVR. And then we need to see what our, our arteries are doing. That's why we're going to get a mean arterial pressure. I hope that is somewhat helpful to give you a visual, but that's what a flow track is. Okay. So I'm going to go back up and I know that this is overwhelming. And that's why I thought we better just start here so that um, as we get going and as spring break is approaching, that you guys have a good understanding going into what you're seeing, okay? Just a few more things that are repeating itself. When we have to treat the contractibility of the heart, we must use a positive inotropic medication, which means it has the ability to get into the muscle and give it umph. That's what it means, okay? to improve the heart contraction. You guys better know your drugs here. Uh, look, digoxin is not usually used as a first line, emer um, first line drug. It's more of an emergency drug in the ICU, um, although patients use it. It's not usually first line. Uh, look, dobutamine, dopamine, milarone, um, whatever one she said is first line. I don't know that she'll ask you which one you get first. I don't think she will but she will ask you about these drugs, okay? Now, there are, we talked about this for just a minute and we're gonna go over it because it applies to what we've already talked about. We are gonna put some lines in the patient to measure, okay? It's called invasive hemodynamic monitoring. One of the ways we can get a pressure is an arterial line. You guys know it goes straight into the artery in the wrist, right? It's going to give us the most accurate blood pressure reading, uh, and uh, we can we can monitor that. Uh, we can also get a central venous line, which can measure CVP, right? Uh, remember that. And then we're going to do a pulmonary arterial catheter. And you guys know that one is the most invasive because it goes through the right atrium, through the right ventricle, and into the pulmonary artery. So that will measure all of our measurements in our heart. What would be some common diagnoses that would need this? Somebody who has impaired tissue perfusion, maybe their output is not very good, the cardiac output, or maybe they have too much volume or too little volume. So we're talking about patients who are really sick, right? This is, we're working in heart doctors or in the ICU, and we're gonna see these things as we work in there. Uh, so you guys know, these are all invasive lines. They're all going to go into the body. Uh, remember invasive lines, you watch for infection. Um, but we've got, uh, when we're looking at an arterial line, uh, you can barely see this picture. You know, we're going to go into the wrist of the patient deep into that artery, right? I saw in your classroom, you guys had a pull with a pressure bag. You should know about that, right? 
And then you should have like a little monitor that is monitoring what's going on in this arterial line. There is something called, and I don't know if I have a, a picture of it, but we're going to have non-compliant tubing, which means the tubing is really uh, tight. It's not, it can't stretch, right? It's a different kind of tubing. It's pressure tubing. And then it's got stopcocks to allow you to turn things off in a transducer. This would be your transducer right here that we can, we can look at this little thing. And then I don't know where the stopcocks are on here. Uh, oh wait, transducer stopcocks are right here somewhere. Okay. So what happens is, and I learned this, I mean, obviously I learned this, but, um, what I want you to know is whenever we put a line in somebody's body, we have to zero it out to atmospheric pressure. Because if we went to Denver, their pressure is different than here in Amarillo, right? Uh, same for respiratory. Whenever they do respiratory treatments on a patient, they look at the atmospheric pressure that's going on. And so we want to measure it. Look, it says this helps level atmospheric pressure within, within the body and within that system. So it says that we can do a pressure flush system. Blah, I can't talk. Uh, fluid is 500 mils of normal saline or an arterial line, either way. Heparinized normal saline, uh, 1,000 units of heparin in 500 mils. And we got a pressure bag, like a blood pressure cuff. We pump it up. She might ask you how high do you pump up the bag, right? 250 to 300 mils, I guess. And then it says the green thing lets you know you pumped it up to the right amount. So there's like a little thing on it. It's a little green thing that will come out like a little button. So how are you, if you get this arterial line, how are you going to, how are you going to zero it out? Okay. Um, we're going to zero it out. We're going to level the transducer to the phlebostatic axis. Okay. Now here's the phlebostatic axis and I'll tell you why. If we go to the fourth intercostal space, that's the fourth rib in between the fourth rib. And then we go under the arm directly to that space like this. There's an angle there. Right there underneath that tissue is the level of the right atrium. This is where we're measuring the pressure. When we are met, when we're leveling the transducer at the phlebostatic axis, which you're gonna have to know, would be the fourth intercostal space and the armpit, it is at uh, right atrium in, in the heart. So that's going to be really important. Um, it's called the mid-axillary line, okay? And that's a board's question, by the way. If it's too high, you could get a false reading. So we've got to make sure we level the pressure, okay? Zero references negates atmospheric pressure. So what happens is... Um, this little stopcock right here, there's like little buttons, they're called stopcocks. What you're gonna do is you're gonna shut them off and then you're gonna turn them back on. And what that does is it says, the zero reference negates atmospheric pressure. You're gonna see, like, so before you do it, you're gonna see this observed waveform. And then when you turn the stopcock and then turn it back on, you're gonna see a square wave come on the screen. It's called the square wave test, which means you zeroed it out to atmospheric pressure. And then you're going to start seeing the line again. Okay. That's what you're doing. You're just taking away, you're just taking away the atmospheric pressure and measuring it only the inside of the body. Uh, remember, if you're going to put an arterial line in, you need a consent for that. You're going to need a consent, I would say, for all the lines, but the arterial line, she specifically says, you need a consent. Nothing given uh, through an art line. Remember, ever, ever, if you see a test question, it says, put this in the arterial line, you better pay attention because that's wrong, right? We're not going to put anything in the arterial line. Um, so, but we can draw blood. We can get frequent ABGs from that line and we can get a blood pressure reading from that line, but we can't put anything in there, all right? We can look at hemodynamic and stability. We can assess the effects of the vasoactive meds that we're putting on. And we can also help, it's a, it will help measure the cardiac uh, output. That's what it will do. Now, this is a board's question. 
And this is my last thing that really I'm going to talk about because I know this is a lot of information and this is 100% why I wanted to record it because you can watch it as many times as you want and always text me with questions or your instructor or whatever. Um, there's something called the Allen's test. And when we get an arterial line, I don't know if you can see my wrist, uh, this arterial line goes into this ulnar artery, okay? Now, they're going to ask you a question. I saw it on UWorld. And what you'll do is, first of all, you'll you'll close your hand, and then you'll put your pressure on both the radial and the ulnar artery, okay? And you put your pressure there. When you open your hand, it's white. What you're going to do is you're going to take the pressure off the ulnar artery, and the hand should pink up. That's how you know that this artery can be used, okay? It tells you it's it's compliant. So um, the question is, what, art, what, what finger do you remove? Do you remove the finger off the ulnar artery or the radial artery? And it's the ulnar artery, okay? Whew, that's a lot of talking, I know. Uh, but know how to do the Allen's test. <clears throat> Allen's test. Um, whenever you put a line in somebody, especially an arterial line, we run a risk of having a thrombus, an embolism. Uh, we could lose blood. I'm just going to take that pee off there. Or we could have an infection. I mean, these are risks, right? These are complications. Um, we definitely have to pay attention to this extremity, uh, wherever the line is, especially an arterial line. Um, every two hours while it's inserted, you want to keep the patient in a new, the wrist in a neutral position. Sometimes they'll tape it down to an arm board so that you're not moving your arm around because if this arterial line comes out, you're going to have blood, all your blood coming out of your body in like two minutes. It's going to be crazy. So check the site and circulation to the extremities. Pressure is five to 10 millimeters higher than a blood pressure cuff. So your reading is going to be a little higher than a blood pressure cuff. And then you're going to set alarms on the patients. So here comes to play. I know you guys had these when you were in, um, level three, but you got the, uh, now I think it's the six P's, but you got the five P's, which you wouldn't want to make sure you look at your pain, pulse, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis. And I think the sixth one is pokythermia, which means is it cold? Um, make sure that it's a neutral position and make sure you know what meds they're on if they're bleeding, right? For sure. And then the last thing, okay, we are going to look at is when you remove this line, okay? You're gonna hold pressure on that arterial line for five to 20 minutes. It's a long time, but you're holding it on an artery. So you better hold it like that person's blood depends on you, right? Achieve hemostasis and apply dressing, a four by four and tape it. Assess and document the removal. And when you remove it, she's probably gonna ask you this question. You better look at the tip of it to make sure that it's there because sometimes the tip can stay inside the artery. So you're gonna, when you DC it, you wanna make sure the tip is intact and you better document that it is, all right? Um, and so these, uh, these are all uh, things we can talk about at another uh, point. And this will help you uh, actually uh, probably will make a video for you uh, that will start here at arterial waveform pressure. But for right now, I'm going to stop my video.